Hi, thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I joined the Copyright Office, as I was just uh, saying to Eric, uh, in 2011, after 15 years of private practice here in D.C. And uh, for me, it was a very fortunate time to join the office. Uh, at that time, uh, our current register, Maria Plante, uh, was the acting register, taking over from uh, the previous register, uh, Mary Beth Peters, who was the longest serving uh, register in history. Um, and uh, that summer of 2011, uh, the Librarian of Congress appointed Maria Plante as the uh, permanent register, a position that she continues to hold to this day. And um, she has uh, shook things up quite a bit at the office. Uh, she has a lot of uh, fresh ideas and a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, so we've been very busy uh, ever since. Uh, one of the first things that she uh, decided to do was to publish this document uh, we call pri uh, Priorities and Special Projects. This was in the fall of 2011. And uh, these were uh, major objectives of the office. Uh, the, the goal was to uh, work on them over a period of two years. Uh, that two-year period has now come to completion. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to give you an overview of what we've been working on and uh, where things stand. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them, uh, either during the presentation or after. Uh, so if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, the document, we had uh, 10 priorities uh, which and 17 special projects. The priorities are, um, to sort of characterize them, are more uh, like policy issues. Uh, and the special projects are things that are uh, unique to the office, the things that we do, uh, our, our administrative functions, uh, which uh, in some cases uh, had were in need of uh, being revisited uh, and uh, taking a fresh look at. Uh, the document itself is available on our website, which of course is copyright.gov. Um, in terms of the, uh, the broad themes, um, one of the two main functions that the office performs is registration and recordation. Registration, of course, is uh, registering works of authorship. Uh, they then uh, folks submit their works to the office. Uh, we take a record of uh, pertinent information about the works, uh, who's the author, when was it published, uh, has it been published. Uh, we take a copy of the, the work itself, which uh, may or may not be offered to the Library of Congress. Uh, and if all the requirements are met, uh, we issue a registration, uh, which then creates uh, certain legal presumptions. Uh, such as that the, the information provided in the certificate is true, uh, that the work itself is copyrightable, uh, and that the registration was issued as of a particular time. Uh, and that uh, affords uh, folks with the ability to uh, enforce their copyrights in U.S. court. Uh, absent a certificate, uh, you are not able to proceed with a, a lawsuit, at least not in certain jurisdictions. Uh, there's some debate among the courts as to whether you have to get a registration in your hand or if you just have to send it to the office, the application first, uh, whether you then have the, the ability to proceed. Uh, we also do recordation, which uh, broadly stated is anything has anything to do with copyrights. Uh, that could be a transfer of ownership. It could be a will. Uh, it could be a license. Uh, it could be uh, a statement from an author saying, I'm still alive uh, as of this date, um, which given that copyright lasts in the case of uh, works by individuals is you know, your life plus 70 years, is that's pertinent information. Uh, we also record things like, uh, uh, for instance, if an author decides to reveal his or her identity, uh, if they publish their work anonymously, um, the term of copyright for an anonymous work is uh, calculated from the, the date of, of creation or publication, uh, which is uh, um, it's 100 years. Um, and But if you, you decide to opt to uh, make your identity known, then you get the life plus 70. So uh, in some instances, it may give you a longer term to, to reveal your identity. So uh, we record those types of documents. Uh, the office is also an office of uh, public policy. Uh, we develop uh, recommendations for Congress uh, on copyright. Uh, right now, we're advising Congress on a, a uh, very substantive and, and far-reaching review of the copyright law. Uh, in terms of whether it's uh, a law which was largely written in the 1950s, uh, 1960s, and codified in 1976, uh, and then updated in the 1990s uh, with the Internet, uh, whether that law uh, still is working today, uh, or whether there are things that need to be uh, revisited or, or re rethought. Uh, so Congress has been having hearings uh, over the past about 12 months now, uh, and that was uh, uh, a decision that they took uh, after the Register published uh, an article uh, in the Columbia Law Journal, uh, what's called uh, the Manji's Lecture. It's named after a famous publisher. Uh, or Was he an attorney? Was he a publishing attorney or a publisher himself? I don't remember. I don't recall. 
you know. Uh, anyway, it's uh, something they publish in Columbia Law, uh, Law Journal every year. Uh, so it's a, it's a major speech, and in this case, uh, it was uh, uh, it was titled uh, "The Next Great Copyright Act," and it uh, outlines uh, the register's concerns about the current law, um, places where it may be showing its age, uh, and that's also available on our website. Um, and in uh, shortly after uh, she published that article, uh, the chairman of the uh, House. Uh, Judiciary Committee uh, Bob Goodlatte uh, attended a, uh, an event at our office on World IP Day, which is uh, in April. It's a, it's a day that uh, marks the anniversary of the World Intellectual Property Day, uh, organization rather. Uh, all around the world, uh, IP organizations uh, mark that day. And uh, at the office, we have, uh, of course, always uh, uh, events as well, where we bring in artists and musicians uh, to, uh, to, uh, enter, uh, to perform. And on that particular day, we invited uh, the chairman, uh, and he uh, made the announcement that uh, the, the committee would be uh, taking up the register's call uh, for a copyright review uh, and uh, scheduling uh, hearings, uh, which they've, they've uh, had, I think, um, at least seven or eight at this point, on, on a wide range of topics uh, from things like uh, first sale, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, voluntary agreements. Um, uh, they have actually one going on today in New York on uh, first sale. Uh, and the third uh, major area of uh, the priorities was uh, enhanced outreach and education. Um, and that's uh, both internal education for our staff, developing new programs uh, so that our, our staff are, are uh, right on the cutting edge of, of uh, what's new uh, in copyright and what's old because, of course, we, we deal not only with the current statute, but because of the term of copyright is so long, we also have to be aware of the copyright law as it existed as far back as 1923. Uh, but then also uh, public outreach uh, to, to get, get the public uh, more engaged uh, and aware of uh, what the office is doing and uh, developments in copyright. Uh, and so the programs that we have at the office itself uh, is part of that, as well as uh, our website, uh, which we're uh, working on uh, doing a major update to. Uh, if you want to see, sort of see the, the, the an artifact of the Internet, uh, we, it, we've had the same website since the, the office created the first one, so it kind of looks, uh, well, it's quite quaint, actually. Um, <laughs> But uh, it, uh, it probably is, is time for a fresh, a freshing up. So um, within the office, we had uh, 10 special committees uh, and uh, involved everyone uh, from our uh, recordation division, our registration division, uh, our public information office, which is uh, the folks that, that answer the phones when you call, uh, our licensing division, uh, which handles um, uh, royalties for a, a wide range of copyright uses that are permitted uh, under the statute. Uh, they're facilitated by, by uh, folks. They, they send royalties into the office. Uh, we put them into treasuries, uh, and then the, the, uh, a panel of judges called the Copyright Royalty Judges uh, determines how to, to divide those up among copyright owners. And uh, that process allows uh, different organizations to make use of copyrighted works without actually negotiating directly with copyright owners. Uh, so, for example, if you uh, have cable or satellite television and you live in particular markets, um, without absent those copyright provisions, uh, you wouldn't be able to get certain signals. Um, and any time that that process uh, breaks down, uh, members of Congress hear about it almost immediately. Uh, so it's actually it's another thing that they're looking at uh, this year on the Hill. The license for satellite companies is scheduled to expire at the end of the year. Uh, so they're holding a series of hearings on whether that uh, license should be extended, and if so, uh, should it be modified in any way. <coughs> Uh, in terms of the policies uh, work that we're doing, uh, here's the list. Uh, it's not a complete list, but uh, these are some of the, the, the major topics. Um, orphan works, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, that is a work of authorship. Uh, was, it's a work that is protected by copyright, uh, but that the owner of which is difficult to find or perhaps uh, una you're unable to find the person. So this would be if you're making a documentary, uh, you find a bunch of great black and white pictures that you'd love to use. Uh, but you know because of the, the time period that they were made in the 1940s, uh, because they were unpublished, they're still protected by copyright, and somebody owns the copyright, uh, either someone who's alive or, if not alive, then they're heirs. Uh, but where do you go to get uh, permission to use that work? Oftentimes it's, it's difficult or impossible to, to find the owners. Uh, this is an issue that the office has been uh, working on for quite some time, um, since 2006. We did, did a major report on this issue. Uh, legislation was proposed uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, but it didn't, uh, was not enacted. Um, and since then, uh, the issue has sort of taken on um, other quirks, uh, mass digitization, the third one there, um, the, the, uh, 
the issue of Google's uh, scanning books uh, and making them available online, uh, the Hathi Trust uh, organization, the, the library partnership, scanning books, uh, all of that has s uh, strong interconnections and overlaps uh, with the Orphan Works issue. Um, so the, the issue itself keeps morphing, uh, and it, uh, we're, we're, we're studying it uh, almost on an ongoing basis uh, to, to provide uh, recommendations on, on what, uh, if anything, Congress should do. Library exceptions, uh, those are provisions of Section 108 of the statute, which allows uh, libraries to make certain uses of works uh, to, to, uh, pres for preservation, but also to provide access uh, through interlibrary loan. Uh, that provision uh, was, was uh, enacted in, uh, along with the rest of the Copyright Act, by and large, in 1976, uh, and at a time when the photocopy machine was uh, seen as the, the great threat. Um, obviously, that, uh, that has changed quite a bit, and uh, so now we're, we're looking at whether uh, and how uh, Section 108 might be updated. Uh, there was a report on that topic, uh, what's called the Section 108 Study Group, a uh, report also available on our website. Uh, that was uh, some years ago. So what we're doing now is, is sort of building on that uh, prior work. Um, small claims, uh, that is uh, a topic we released um, uh, in our report uh, last September. A small claim would be uh, what, just what it sounds like, something you would expect to find on uh, like the People's Court. Um, where people have a dispute, uh, but there's not a lot of money at, at stake. Uh, now, by, by law, all copyright cases are supposed to be brought in federal court. Uh, it's a federal claim, uh, and the federal courts have jurisdiction over them to give uniformity throughout the, the country. But um, because uh, copyright owners oftentimes have small disputes, uh, it's difficult for them to uh, find legal representation. Uh, or to afford the, the, to deal with the complexity of federal court litigation. And there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, artists, small businesses who have said to us, you know, look, we, we need, really would like to have an alternative process, some way where we can bring our claims uh, but without having to uh, hire a lawyer to, to prosecute them. That notwithstanding the fact that the law itself, the copyright law, uh, allows uh, copyright owners to recover attorney's fees if they registered their work uh, in a timely manner, that is to say, prior to the, the infringement. That's one of the, another one of the key benefits of, of doing registration is uh, you have the possibility of getting your lawyer fees paid. But even then, uh, you know, not all lawyers are willing to take cases that are only worth you know, $5,000 uh, or less. Um, illegal streaming, uh, this deals with a provision of the criminal copyright code. Um, currently, there are uh, criminal provisions for uh, folks who engage in criminal copyright activity. Uh, there are misdemeanors and there are felonies, uh, but there are only felonies for uh, people who uh, reproduce a work, make copies, or distribute them. Um, doing a public performance is also uh, a crime, uh, if done with uh, the requisite criminal intent, of course. Uh, but the penalty is only misdemeanor. Now, there's no felony uh, liability for uh, public performance. Uh, and you might say, well, you know, who cares? Uh, but going forward, uh, in, in the today's environment and more so in the future, uh, making copies, physical copies, and, and uh, selling them on, on a store uh, or through the mail uh, obviously is becoming less and less important. Uh, folks are uh, enjoying works online far, uh, far and more. Uh, services like Pandora uh, with, uh, do uh, radio performances. Uh, services like Netflix are doing online video performances. So um, all, all, as that, that method of communication becomes more prevalent, uh, there's a real gap in the law in terms of on, on the criminal side. Um, and finally, public performance right and sound recordings. Uh, this is an issue that the office has struggled with uh, for many, many years. Um, briefly stated, uh, when you have a piece of music, uh, you have a, a song that you've downloaded, uh, that work has actual two, actually has two copyrights in it. Uh, one is the actual music, the notes, the lyrics, uh, and the second component is the recording itself. Uh, so it's not just uh, 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 My Old Flame, the song, uh, the classic standard by Sinatra, but it's that recording of My Old Flame as opposed to the one by Stacey Kent or the one by Michael Bublé. Each recording is, has a different copyright attached to it. And the copyright law provides uh, many different exclusive rights to authors. Uh, one of which is the right to perform the work in public, uh, but that right only is provided to the folks who own the copyright in the music and the lyrics. The folks who own the copyright in the sound recording do not have that right, uh, at least not uh, only with respect to uh, what, what are called digital transmissions. So when you, if you do like a webcast, if you listen to it uh, over your internet connection, uh, they have the right to control that. But when you hear it on the radio in your car, uh, the, the folks who own the sound recording are not getting paid a dime for that. Um, that's an issue, a, a real disparity in the law. Uh, the United States is almost alone 
in not having in, in having this uh, differing treatment, uh, and so the office has long recommended that uh, that that uh, situation be rectified. Uh, so here are some of the reports that we put out uh, over the past two years. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, the uh, uh, statutory license. This is that I mentioned, uh, as cable and satellite. Uh, the office is, uh, was asked to do a report from Congress that this is was in sort of connection with this this deadline of this year where the satellite license expires. And uh, the basic question was, uh, simply put, uh, should we keep the licenses? Should we get rid of them? If we want to get rid of them, how do we do it? Or how might we do it? Uh, and this was our, our recommendation. Um, our, the bottom line was we, we thought that the licenses uh, served a purpose when they were created. Uh, they made the, 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 the cap they brought the, allowed the cable industry to grow into what it is today. Uh, but we think that they've served their purpose, and it's time to uh, start phasing them out. Uh, and we provided some uh, suggestions for how that might happen. Uh, the mass digitization document was uh, this is a follow-on to the uh, the Google Books case, uh, which is sort of a, a a survey of where the law was uh, when that decision was came out. Uh, pre-1972 sound recordings. Uh, another quirk about sound recordings is that they're only protected by copyright as of February 15th, 1972, by the federal statute. Prior to that, they are protected by state law. Uh, so the question here is, should we? make them uh, like all other works of authorship and just treat them where uh, they're all covered by the federal statute. Uh, and if so, if we want to make that change, uh, what are the implications? Um, small claims, uh, that's the report I mentioned about um, uh, 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 small copyright claims. Our recommendation there uh, was to perhaps create a, a tribunal, an administrative tribunal within the Copyright Office with perhaps three adjudicators. Um, because of constitutional concerns, the process itself would have to be voluntary, so both the copyright owner and the, uh, the, the defendant would have to agree to, to, uh, to um, join the, the have the, the copyright office uh, handle the pr proceeding uh, and waive their rights to proceed in federal court. Uh, we thought because that should be limited to small claims uh, with value of no more than $30,000, uh, that the tribunal should have uh, the, the ability to award damages and, and uh, injunctive relief. Um, but that the process itself should be very streamlined. So it should all be done on paper, no personal appearances, no motions, uh, maybe telephone conferences, uh, but try to keep the process as, as streamlined as poss possible so that keep costs down. Um, that's a recommendation to Congress. Uh, obviously, the office has no uh, uh, authority to create such a, a process. It would have, have to be something that Congress would, uh, would put together. Uh, resale royalty. Uh, this is a, a report we did on... Uh, copyright uh, in visual, works of visual art, paintings, uh, sculpture. Uh, and the issue there is uh, when you sell a painting, uh, if you're a struggling artist and then 20 years later your work is recognized and now it's worth millions and that work is sold and resold and resold at auction, uh, should the artist uh, get a share of that? Should they get a resale royalty uh, on when the, the work is resold? Uh, two reports we're working on right now. Uh, one is what's called the Making Available Right. Uh, this is a, a provision that's in the, the Berne Convention. It's, a, it's an international copyright convention that the U.S. belongs to. It says that uh, all member countries will provide authors with the right to uh, make their work available, meaning that the, the they, the they and they alone have the right to control when their work is being made available. Um, the, the U.S. has always taken the position that that our current statute provides that right. Uh, we don't use these precise words, making available. Um, but there's been some question by the courts uh, recently as to whether uh, what we call the right of re reproduction, the right of distribution, the right of public performance, whether that is, in fact, uh, uh, covering that, that making available right. So that's, that's an issue we're looking at now um, at the request of uh, the, the House subcommittee. And also a major study, major study, on music licensing. Uh, and that, that includes uh, both the statutory licenses, but also uh, how the actual music business uh, works and whether it's working uh, or whether it might be uh, things that Congress could look at as far as uh, uh, government could, could do to, to facilitate um, uh, making music more available more readily to folks. Um, some other areas, uh, I'll just highlight a couple of these. Uh, we recently uh, did a study of our fees, the, the fees that we charge. Um, we are author authorized by Congress to uh, raise our fees uh, every few years. We, we do a study uh, which looks at um, how much uh, time does it take us to actually do the things that we do. Uh, and it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. We don't say, oh, it takes us you know, $100 to do the service. Uh, we typically don't charge full, full price because uh, the, the, we're, we're providing a public service and we want to encourage people to uh, register their works with us, record their uh, 
documents with us. And all of that is done on a permissive basis. And, you know, unless you want to go file a lawsuit, you have no obligation to register your works with the office. So we want to uh, encourage people to, to do that and to make the, the process as accessible as possible to both you know, the major corporations as well as the small artists. Uh, we try to take those into account when we, we set our fees. Um, uh, the last one is that the electronic administration of the statutory licenses. Uh, we are moving more and more of our services online. Uh, re uh, the registration process is by and large online now. Uh, right now we're looking at uh, moving the licensing process as well as the recordation process uh, online as well. Um, in terms of uh, registration priorities, uh, a group registration is a process that allows you to, instead of just sending in one, one work, you know, here's one issue of a magazine, uh, you can send in here's three months worth of issues. Or instead of one article, here's all the articles I created over the past 12 months. So these are, are what we call registration accommodations. The statute allows us to um, uh, create uh, sort of administrative flexibility to allow people to, uh, who might otherwise not register uh, to, to, to send in groups of works as long as they have some uh, logical relationship between them and that are, that are specified in our regulations, we can then issue a single registration covering uh, multiple works. Uh, that saves time. It also saves money because you only have to pay one filing fee and you can send in everything at once. Um, an issue that we're always struggling with is uh, how to handle digital works. Uh, you know, we, we, we have all, long lived in a world where people would send in physical copies. Uh, now the office is, uh, is taking in digital copies as well. But uh, the question is, well, if it's, is, is the work only, uh, all, does it only exist in digital form or is it digital and a hard copy? And if it's both, well, which one should you send in? Which one do we want? Uh, both for purposes of registration, but also for uh, the public record, uh, the record that winds up at the Library of Congress. Uh, technical upgrades, this is uh, something we're, we're always working on. Uh, right now, as I said, we're focusing on recordation uh, and licensing. Um, the compendium is our uh, internal manual. Uh, we have you know, various sources of authority. We have the statute, which uh, gives us authorization to do the things we do. We have regulations that we passed uh, based upon that statutory authority. And then we have an internal document that uh, fleshes out a lot of the things that are not specified in, in the statute. Uh, and this is a, a document that uh, was written in 1984, it has not been updated since then. It is, uh, to say woefully out of date uh, is, is perhaps uh, n not an understatement. Um, it was written by and large for the folks at the office to tell them what they should do or how they should handle things. Uh, so this is a, a project we worked on where to make it, not, not only to, to cover things that have happened since 1984, uh, for example, the fact that you know, obviously we didn't have electronic online registration in, back then. Uh, but also to, to rewrite it for an entirely different audience so to make it both for the, the folks on staff but also m m much more so for the public so they have another resource to where they can go and say, well, I have a question. I don't really understand. What am I supposed to do? How do I do this? Uh, and it spells out in a much more friendly way uh, um, our various processes. Uh, and then, of course, I mentioned uh, recordation. Um, another uh, project we're working on, this is a picture of our card catalog. Uh, for years, uh, we kept all of our copyright records on cards in a card catalog. It's one of the largest in the world. Uh, if you'd like to see it in person, uh, you can visit me at the James Madison Building on Capitol Hill. Uh, but we're now in the process of digitizing those cards uh, because that was, you know, until now, that's the only way you could see them. You have to come per per physically into the office to see records from pre-1978. Uh, so we're, we're trying to make those records uh, available online. Anything post-78 uh, you can get uh, through our online database. Um, and then we're also doing a, a variety of uh, outreach. Uh, we have partnerships with, um, with uh, one of the professors here at GW who's uh, working in-house. Uh, Professor Bob Brown Ice is working on our uh, recordation uh, update. Uh, we also got uh, comments on that, on that rulemaking from uh, the folks at Stanford. I uh, had uh, a great contribution to, uh, to the debate. Um, and uh, some of these other things that I mentioned, uh, we're going to be having a new website, as I said, uh, and then our own internal um, partnerships, or, or training, rather. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to field them. I wanted to uh, ask a little bit more about uh, Orphan Works. Do you anticipate at uh, any time in the near future, legislation on orphan works being reintroduced in Congress. Uh, Judge Chin, in his uh, Google, uh, the uh, uh, written opinion on the Google uh, settlement, 
Uh, the parties ended up, uh, ended up settling uh, thereafter. But one of the things, and, and I guess I'm really paraphrasing here, is uh, he indicated that a topic like Orphan Works, it's best for Congress to review that and not the courts. So do you anticipate anything in the near future regarding Orphan Works? Well, it's, it's a good question, and it's difficult to say. Um, you know, like I said, this is an issue that uh, folks have been thinking about since 2006, uh, and even prior to that. And uh, you know, in the hearings that have already been held, um, uh, while there has been no hearing, um, you know, that's devoted entirely to to orphan works, there was a, a hearing on um, what they called uh, preservation and reuse of copyrighted works, which was um, uh, directed to a wide range of, of library concerns, and orphan works was was one of them. Um, but in one of the earlier hearings, we had a group of people who said. Uh, you know what, we really need orphan works legislation. Like, we've got to have it. Uh, that was a representative from uh, the, the, of all people. I mean, you, you would think, oh, maybe documentary producer would say that, or maybe somebody like a, a tech company like Google. But actually it was um, the, dra the Dramatist Guild, uh, because the, the Dramatists uh, are, you know, by and large, they reuse material when they create plays, when they create musicals. Uh, so they said that that's something they really want. They want orphan works legislation. At the same time, the photographer said, we don't want orphan works legislation. Absolutely not. We don't need that. We don't want it. Um, they were one of the groups that were uh, uh, very opposed, much opposed, when legislation was proposed on Capitol Hill. So there's a lot of strong emotions uh, on both sides. And you know, while the initial proposal, uh, which was floated uh, in, in uh, I guess, around 2007, 2008, uh, the idea was, well, we will uh, limit your liability. That's, that's sort of a, in a nutshell. Uh, the idea is if, if you go out and you do a, a good faith search, you try to find the copyright owner, uh, you document what you did. Uh, if you find the person, great, maybe you, you negotiate your license. But if you can't find them, uh, but you, you, you show, well, I made an effort, uh, then we will, we're not going to waive the copyright if that person later shows up. Uh, but we're going to say, well, you're, we're going to limit the, the, the amount that you can claim against the, the, the user. Um, and there's been, I remember reading one of the comments, uh, folks from one of the libraries said, well, you know, that, that's a, a great idea, but as a practical matter, you know, the only thing that might fly in the end of the day would be just a cap on statutory damages, saying, well, you know, if, you, if you go, uh, if this turns out to be an orphan work, uh, we'll, we'll limit the amount of damages that you can do, but without requiring the, the investigation part of it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of proposals out there, uh, and it, it's an issue that definitely Congress is looking at, the office is looking at. Uh, and you know what what the the prospects for a solution are uh, at this point remain to be seen. So I can kind of follow up on that. Um, uh, this is a conference on ethics and publishing, and uh, there's always going to be vested interests who oppose any change of anything having to do with intellectual property because they've got they they already have their horses running on a particular track. That's the track they want to have maintained. But there are certain things that are now possible with digital information that wasn't possible before, do you in the Copyright Office feel ethical obligations to look out for the, for the public good? Or uh, how, how do you deal with ethics and, and ethical responsibilities? Or is it something that's, that I hesitate to say, merely legalistic? Because that makes it sound like it's merely about the law. But do you have, do you have discussions about, about the ethics and the, and the public good? Uh, in one word, absolutely. But that's that's what the office is there for. Okay, we we are there to uh, be an intermediary between all the parties uh, and to provide Congress as well as the the parties themselves with uh, you know impartial, uh, thoughtful analysis about uh, the implications of what folks are asking for. Um, you know when the copyright law was enacted and, or, and negotiated in the '60s and the '70s. Um, you know, many of the players were, were the same as they are today. You, know, you have the music industries, the music publishers, the music performers. Uh, you had the broadcasters. Uh, you had libraries. Um, but by and large, at that time, there was no there was no organization speaking on behalf of the public, public interest. Uh, and it was just assumed that, uh, and to some extent, the libraries, uh, their position was, well, we speak, uh, we articulate the public interest. But but by and large, there was no organization speaking on their behalf. Uh, and the office filled that role. Uh, and today, you, we do have organizations uh, like uh, uh, Public Knowledge, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, various others, uh, who uh, you know, were, were established to, to represent 
the public interest, um, and, and they each of them each of them have their own um, view on what the public is or what it means. Um, but even so, it's 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 hard to say who speaks for the public interest because you know copyright touches everyone, it touches all all of our lives in a very intimate and personal way. And it's uh, as the register likes to say, it's an ecosystem. We all sort of coexist with each other, and I'm sure every player in that ecosystem feels like what they're doing is you know, helpful to their members and their interests, but it's also in part of, uh, you know, serves the, the greater good, whether that is in terms of uh, encouraging authors to create new works, uh, in terms of getting those works out to the public in a, a very convenient and cost-effective way. Um, so it, it really is a question of, well, everyone claim, may, may purport to, to speak or, or, or at least appreciate the public interest, uh, it, it is a, a, a challenge sometimes to, to balance uh, the competing interests. So we might have time for one more brief question, if there is one. When you look at the Falcon numbers, new title output, ISBNs, how many books do you process each year for copyright registration, hard copy? And if this business went 100% digital books tomorrow, could you process a million and a half hardcover books or a million and a half Ebooks mm -hmm. in one year. What's what's your capacity? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there are folks at the office, and I'd be happy to give you my card, and I, I can get you in touch with them uh, who do. Um, you know, currently we have the ability to take in uh, e deposits, and we take them in every day. Uh, and we, but we, the, the way our regulations are set up, we only take ebooks if the book is published exclusively in an electronic format. That there's no hard copy. If there's a hard copy, we want the hard copy. Uh, and that's just the way our regulations are written. Um, and we're, you know, starting the process now of uh, reevaluating uh, both what, what the regulations say in, sort of in terms of what we need for purposes of registration, uh, but also uh, we have to, to take into account uh, what the library wants. Um, we're part of the library, and uh, uh, while we are, you know, are an independent organization, we obviously have to be uh, aware of their concerns in terms of getting uh, the deposits that they want. Um, and um, you know, but and and but it's not just for uh, books that are are uh, unpub books that are, are published exclusively in an e format. Other kinds of materials we can take electronically. Uh, for example, things that are unpublished, uh, or for certain categories of things that that uh, like electronic serials, for example, is a category that we recently created. Uh, that those would be serials that only exist in you know electronic form. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.